we are in a different time period that we did pass the hinge point in 2020. And I am convinced we are in a different time period. Things are not the same as they were for my parents. Um, and even my, you know, some of my older brothers and, and sisters, it's not the same. It's a different, it's a different world. Yeah. The times are different. Things are accelerating and um, we need well, President Nelson say, what did we take? We need to take extraordinary measures because unprecedented times require unprecedented measures. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Spiritual Survival Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Brown. Our team's mission is to help you have eyes to see the times we are living in, take unprecedented measures, you prepare yourself spiritually for the events that will precede the second coming of Jesus Christ. If the mission of our podcast resonates with you, please click subscribe, like, and share this content. It's 2024. It's 2024. If you haven't, if you haven't woken up yet, it's time to wake up. It's time. The alarm is ringing. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of Spiritual Survival. Uh, I've got an exciting guest with me today, Rob Yuri, and uh, he's going to share some things, but I'm going to uh, let, uh, lay a little bit of foundation for him first. Um, it's now 2024. Uh, it's a new year, and uh, my question to all of you is, uh, are you awake yet? <laughs> And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And Rob's got uh, some neat things he's going to share. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I wanted to start off by thanking everybody for the, the really wonderful comments we've had the last few weeks. Uh, there's been a, a ton of comments and people have been sharing uh, amazing experiences. Um, they've been sharing trials that they've gone through, which I think really helps a lot of people to, when people open up like that and, and are authentic and, and share some of their trials and struggles. <laughs> and a lot of people have shared how these things have been leading them into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. So I want to start off today by sharing a, a little bit of an experience I had yesterday in the temple. Um, I was in the, the celestial room of the Bountiful Temple and I had a group of people approach me, and uh, they had they've been uh, listeners to the podcast, and uh, they uh, they shared a little bit about their uh, awakening experiences. Um, I've shared my my experience in 2020, the experience my wife and I have had of of really waking up to the times we were in, and and how that spurred us to do so many things that I call unprecedented measures. And as I was visiting with these uh, these people in the celestial room, uh, I mentioned we're living in interesting times, aren't we? <laughs> and uh, one of them responded, uh, "2024 is going to wake up a lot of people," and I just happen to agree with that <laughs> very strongly. And uh, that's one of the reasons I have Rob Uri on Rob Yuri uh, with me today. Uh, Rob reached out to me. Uh, well, now it's been a few weeks back and uh, shared uh, that he's had kind of a similar uh, wake-up experience to what I've had and how 2020 had a big effect on him, uh, particularly the earthquake that happened here in Utah, um, Moroni's horn falling to the ground, uh, the eclipse, and it's led him to to jump in and do some, uh, some searching and some research. Um, and so I think you'll find what, what he's prepared for us today to be quite fascinating. Um, kind of my purpose in, in putting this week's episode together is, you know, for those of you who have friends or loved ones who maybe aren't fully on board with where we are in, in, uh, in time, the times we're in, um, I hope this video can be maybe something you can send to them. I hope it can provide some things for them to ponder and maybe, you know, reach out to the Lord and uh, ask about. And I hope it can be a, a catalyst for many to begin searching more deeply, searching things like Isaiah, um, Revelation, and particularly the Book of Mormon. As we go through this year, my hope is that uh, many of you can 
read the Book of Mormon from a different perspective. Uh, read it, uh, in essence, looking for types of the events that we will see maybe in the next three years, seven years, ten years, and uh, seek to be taught by the Lord himself. So, Rob, welcome, welcome to our episode. I'm very excited to have you. <laughs> let's let's jump in. Um, the question I have for you that you can probably answer with some of the things you've prepared is uh, I think a lot of members of the church, they just think that uh, the Savior is just going to show up one day. Um, they they don't, when they say, uh, you know, hope the second coming is soon, they uh, haven't really thought through or, or searched deeply to understand the process <laughs> or, you know, the things that have to play out um, in advance of that to prepare us. And so, yeah, if you if you maybe want to share your screen and, and yeah. share some things, yeah, and, yeah, yeah it, it's you know, and 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 fair enough, it's very confusing. And and as I started going through, you know, let's see, how do I share my screen here? Okay, there we go. All right, can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So. <clears throat> Yeah, and fair enough, it is very confusing because um, there are, uh, well, uh, why, why don't I just go through this? Yeah. Because I will be able, I think I'll be able to answer, it, answer your question, and I think I'll be able to get to it fairly specifically and fairly, fairly quickly. Um, let's see. Okay, so the great astrophysicist, we call the Savior, you know, one of his titles, he's got numerous titles. Uh, and one of the one of the titles that that uh, I I proposed um, far be it for me to propose a title, but um, I've done it. The great astrophysicist, and we know through modern day revelation that he is the executive creator of the universe. That uh, I, I view it that our Father in heaven is is it like a corporate structure would be more like the chairman of the board, and the Savior would be like the CEO of making all this stuff happen. Okay. Um, so the, the background of my slide, the Hubble Deep Field, this is actually the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. I just want to go through this really quick because I just want to <clears throat> just substantiate a little bit um, why I use the title, The Great Astrophysicist. Um, in 1994, uh, I think we launched Hubble in 1990, and in 19, there were several problems with it, and I think they got most of them all resolved by out by 1993 and then in 1994 there were a handful of images that came back that hinted that Hubble could really look deeply into space. Um, Robert Williams was the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute and as the director he had 10% of the viewing time as his discretionary time. He could pretty much without committee or without anything he could basically say this is what we're going to do with the telescope which was fortunate he did. Um, he, he wanted to point it at a spot that was dark in the sky and just see what you could find. And there were a number of people who thought that this was going to be a waste of valuable viewing time. Um, but he decided he was going to do it. He assembled a team to, the sky, to decide where they were going to point the telescope. Um, and they had to, the spot had to be so nearly empty of stars and nearby galaxies. Otherwise, that, that nearby light would crowd out the distant light. And so they spent about a year trying to figure out where they were going to point the telescope. It took them a year to decide the spot. And they found a spot, and it was near the handle of the Big Dipper. And then on December 18th uh, through 28th, they basically did 342 separate exposures. Uh, you know, and these are, these are like, you know, fairly long-term long exposures. And what they found when they got back and made a composite of these images is that the image revealed 3,000 galaxies. And this blew, this turned the scientific community, the astrophysics community for sure, the astronomy community on their ear because they just, they just it, it basically blew people away. And that, that image led to an estimate of about 200 billion galaxies. So subsequent observations and research had uh, have basically brought that number at least as far as about 2016 to two trillion galaxies 
Mm. So that's that's an amazing number of galaxies out there in the universe. Mm. And it, if you just to make the numbers round, you just estimate, you know, somewhere between 100 and 400 billion galaxy or stars per galaxy. So let's pick 250 billion. And then you basically multiply that out and you get one septillion stars. Now, I don't know if you can understand what septillion is. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what septillion is. I can tell you how many zeros it is, but I don't understand it. The other thing that's really interesting is each star has its own system of planets and asteroids. Now, that may be like virtually nothing, or it may be just a, a solar system teeming with all sorts of, all sorts of um, you know, celestial bodies. Um, so here we go. <clears throat> that's what, that's what one septillion looks like. Wow. So that's a big number. And if I had a penny for every star that in the, in the, what we call the known universe today, I'd probably have a little bit more money than either Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or both of those guys put together. Um, so let's see. So there's the, there's the, okay. So <clears throat> Now we're going to jump back. So Joseph Smith, what an amazing individual. We're going to jump back in eight, right after he organized the church. Um, the Book of Mormon was published, and so he began translating the Old Testament. And by, by I think it was February of 1831, um, he had completed the, I think the Book of Moses came out uh, sometime around then. I'm not, I'm not completely sure on the dates. But let's just read a couple of these. And worlds without number have I created, and I also created them for mine own purpose. And by the Son I created them, which is mine only begotten. And the Lord God spake unto Moses, saying, The heavens they are many, and they cannot be numbered unto men, but they are numbered unto me, for they are mine. <clears throat> so Joseph Smith, he basically puts this out unapologetically, no peer review. He just puts it out there and says, Here you go. This is truth. And there's another, there's another very, I think it's just a <clears throat> super interesting little story in the book of Moses, the first chapter. And it came to pass that it was for the space of many hours before Moses did again receive his natural strength like unto man. And he said unto himself, now for this cause, I know that man is nothing, which thing I had never supposed. So you get the sense that Moses, well, in, in, in some direct words, that Moses got, you know, whisked up off the earth and got a view. We don't know exactly how that works, but he got a view of the universe, some level of the universe, certainly of our solar system and how it may be sat within the universe. We don't really uh, get enough information to know exactly what he saw. But he looked at it, and he's just going, we're nothing. We are tiny little specks. We're insignificant. And then... Later on in the chapter, you get, for behold, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. So the, the Lord tells Moses, not Moses, not only are you nothing, not only are you not nothing, you are everything and you are the key man is the key reason for all of this. And to me, that... <laughs> Um, just speaks to the majesty of our Father in Heaven and the Savior. So there it is. There's the that's a, just a portion of the Hubble Deep Field, and so I don't, I'm not sure exactly what that that probably represents about five or six thousand galaxies right there. That that image. Um, <clears throat> so here's another thing. So part of my journey. Part of my journey is I would start talking to people. I'd get excited about some of the stuff I'd found, and I'd start talking to people. Um, sometimes a lot of people would talk to me, but a lot of people, it was almost like I had a, a third ear on my forehead. They would, I'd start talking about signs. I'd start talking about eclipses. I'd start talking about different things, and I would get Fairly frequently, I would get, basically, I would get shut down. I learned to stop talking to people as soon as they would stop listening. <laughs> I learned that I would just stop talking. <clears throat> um, and there was, there was this notion that we really shouldn't even talk about it, and that it was kind of taboo. And uh, so, so this is a, 
Uh, we, we don't have time to go into it, but it's a very interesting way that Joseph Smith taught this. It was in February of 1844, just probably, what, four or five months before he was martyred. If we do not understand the signs of the times and the spirit of prophecy, we are apt to be lost. So these are two things that are just super important, I think, is understanding the times we're living in, the nature of the changes that are going to be coming upon the earth, and also having the spirit of prophecy. And I think, Randy, you've had some just some wonderful podcasts and just wonderful guests that have really spoken to that, spoken especially to the spirit of prophecy. And Yeah, as I was, uh, I just came from an endowment session, and I was praying for a little bit of inspiration on maybe some things I could add to to our podcast today. And the things that came to my mind was actually to invite the listeners to pray for the spirit of prophecy for us to understand the, the signs of the times and where we're at. Th that is a gift that we should be seeking. Um, and we should be praying for eyes to see. Uh, I, I think there's so many people who haven't really taken president Nelson's invitation to seek to be taught by the Lord himself maybe as as seriously and as deeply as they could <laughs> and and they're kind of locked in these little boxes of uh veils of unbelief and uh, it, it's my strong belief that we should be seeking to break out of those those boxes of current belief systems and rend veils of unbelief and that's what we're being invited to do um yeah well we... i mean go ahead oh, i'm sorry go ahead i was just saying uh you know if, I feel like that's what President Nelson is inviting us to do, is to rend veils of unbelief um, and, and not just to rely on him or any other man to, to know the, the mysteries of the universe. And I'm going to share a scripture here a little bit later, but uh, I mean, we, we are, we've been asked by President Nelson to seek the mysteries, to seek the deeper things. And, and also to, um, strive to bind ourselves to Christ in covenant. And once these things, once we start to see these things, we see how absolutely essential it is that we spend as much time in the temple as we possibly can. And that we are seeking to bind ourselves to Christ through covenants. And, and it's through this connection that this power will flow that will not only enable us to see where we're at and what's coming, but to, to be able to have power to uh, work miracles to get through it. So sorry, I, I probably kind of threw you off track there a bit. No, no. I mean, I agree with you 100%. Uh, I, I absolutely have a testimony of, I have a testimony of the temple. And, you know, as I've really kind of gone through this whole journey, as I said, as I was saying that I, I, I've started to see things in the scriptures that I just can't unsee. In fact, um, songs as we're singing in church, you know, as we're singing hymns, um, I just start seeing all sorts of uh, second coming topics and um, phrases yeah, and things. And yeah. it's just, I mean, it's just coming out of everywhere and it's just, you just can't unsee it. And the, I mean, the temple endowment, what a, what a wonderful, what a wonderful pattern and what a wonderful, like learning what that, learning what that means. And, you know, you're kind of dumped out in this crazy, you know, crazy world and you got to find your way through it, but you get help and you basically have to. And I think it, you know, uh, the, I think the, you know, a good word is a sin is a sin. You know, you basically, you're, you're, you're kind of like, you're going up a set of stairs or you're going up a ladder. And I think there's a, a number of scripture references that, that those would tie to that. And, and until you have to go up that, you have to ascend that ladder until you get back into the presence of our father in heaven. And um, so just amazing. You, you, you said rending the belts of unbelief. And I think, you know, it's so easy um, and it was so easy for me for so many years to just be right in the middle of Babylon and basically be thinking that I'm doing important stuff. And I was doing important stuff, but I was, I didn't have, I didn't have the proper uh, perspective or balance 
as I look back and I just, um, you know, do I have regrets? Uh, yeah, probably I do probably have a few regrets that I didn't, I, there were things that I didn't do because I just was so focused on uh, my career in Babylon <clears throat> and, uh, um, the, the veil of unbelief. I think, you know, you said that the thing that popped into my mind when you said that is like, I, I can't remember the exact words, but I think it's a, it's a commandment in ether four. Uh, Moroni's talking, maybe it's not a commandment, but basically ether chapter four is just an amazing chapter. You go read that and um, what, what an amazing chapter. Um, yeah. What's so anyways, interesting uh, that, uh... President Nelson gave this invitation for us to seek to be taught by the Lord himself in 2020. And I, I think uh, when we begin to see what took place in 2020, we begin to see how significant that year was. And then we begin to see how significant the beginning and ending of this, uh, uh, this eclipse that we're about to talk about here shortly. And it seems like to me that 2020 was... Uh, Kind of like a first wake-up call to a, a good number of, of Latter-day Saints. And I feel like 2024 is going to be the next big wake-up call. This year we're in right now. <clears throat> and I think yeah. There's some yeah it's, I mean, I, I things that happen. Um, yeah. That might even uh, cause 2020 to pale in comparison. Again, that's my personal feelings. But uh, anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I have, I, you know, I have, I have similar feelings. I, I kind of hope I'm wrong, but, um, oh, we got to get through it to get to the second coming. So let's bring it on. We do. Okay. So let's, let's do this. So one of the things that's really important is we, we, it's really important. And it, and it took me, it was probably six or seven months of intense study. And I was just confused and I was just having a hard time sorting everything out until I like found this. And I'm going to share this key with you. And uh, so whatever you guys think of this, you can, you can think whatever you want of it. But once I realized this, then all of a sudden, all these different scriptures talking about the second coming started falling in place because I felt like I knew what, what they were talking about. So um, I'm going to use four references. I'm going to keep it very simple. We could spend hours on this. We could, there's hundreds and hundreds of references we could use, but I mean, you could literally, you could do 10 hours on this, but I'm going to break it down to four very simple, specific references. The first one is Joseph Smith Matthew. The second one is a talk from Ezra Taft Benson. He was the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles at the time, and this is December 9th of uh, 1979. I'm sure he probably gave this talk more than once, but that was one of the times he gave the talk. And uh, then there in Bruce R. McConkie, he's a new witness for the Articles of Faith, and there's a similar quote in The Millennial Messiah. I chose this one because I, I think it, I, I liked it a little bit better, but they both say essentially the same thing. And then there's an infographic in the April 2021 Leahona. So let's start with Joseph Smith Matthew. And we'll just read it. For as the light, so as, as soon as we see as, we know we have a simile. So, for as the light of the morning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, and covereth the whole earth, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So, we're getting simile. So, the coming of the Son of Man, this is, of course, this is the Savior talking. And this is Joseph Smith giving us, a, 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 I think it's verse 27 in Matthew, 20, in Matthew 24 out of the Old Te New Testament, excuse me. Uh, and that, that ends up in Matthew, uh, Joseph Smith, Matthew 1, it's verse 26, and he actually, uh, it's changed a little bit, and it's, a, it's, very, uh, it's very helpful. It's a very helpful change. So you get basically uh, the light of the morning cometh out of these, and how does the light happen? Well, it starts, it starts gradually getting lighter, and pretty soon you can, make out the, you can make out the horizon on the eastern sky, and then the sky gets brighter and brighter and brighter, and it's a process that happens over you know, minutes or hours, <clears throat> and then finally the sun peaks over, and then the sun starts really shining on the on the uh, 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 wherever you are on the earth, and then as it gets, uh, the sun moves up higher in the sky, and finally the whole sun is visible. So a process that takes maybe, you know, somewhere between two and three hours, I think. Um, it's a gradual process. It's not like it's the middle of the night, full dark night, uh, night, and then all of a sudden snap you know snap your fingers and then boom it's fully light it's it's a gradual process 
And let's see. Okay, so so I think that's enough said on that one. So we'll go to Ezra Taft Benson. This will take probably about four minutes, and I think it might be worth reading it. If you want to read this, you're, you're welcome to read it, Randy, or I'm I'm happy to read it. Sure, I'll read it. Okay. Um, there's there's probably like four or five slides, so probably about four minutes. It's like your four minute talk. <laughs> He told the twelve, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. From John 14, 2 and 3. As the time of his departure drew nigh, he took them to a place outside of Bethany. There he imparted his last instructions and blessing to the twelve. He then arose while they beheld and ascended to heaven, and a cloud received him out of their sight. As the apostles stood looking up, two heavenly messengers appeared and spoke. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. Since that day, 19 centuries have come and gone. Because he has not yet come, some scoffingly say, as Peter prophesied, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Second Peter 3, 4. So, yeah, so we can keep going. And, okay. and again, this is President Benson, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And he's going to quote a lot of scriptures here. Before he comes, the testimony of the servants of God will be rejected by and large. Because of this rejection, great calamities will befall nations of the world, for the Lord himself has declared it. For after your testimony cometh the testimony of earthquakes that shall cause groanings in the midst of her, and men shall fall upon the ground and shall not be able to stand. And also cometh the testimony of the voice of thunderings and the voice of lightnings and the voice of tempests and the voice of the waves of the sea heaving themselves beyond their bounds. And all things shall be in commotion and surely men's hearts shall fail them. <clears throat> for, uh, for fear shall come upon all people. And there shall be men standing in that generation that shall not pass until they shall see an overflowing scourge, for a desolating sickness shall cover the land. But my disciples shall stand in holy places and shall not be moved. But among the wicked, men shall lift up their voices and curse God and die. And there shall be earthquakes also in diverse places and many desolations. Yet men will harden their hearts against me, and they will take up the sword one against another, and they will kill one another. The world will present a scene of conflict such as never has never been experienced before. Still, men's hearts will be hardened to the revelations from heaven. Even greater signs shall then be given to manifest the approaching great day of the Lord. And they shall see signs and wonders, for they shall be shown forth in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. And they shall behold blood and fire and vapors of smoke. And before the day of the Lord shall come, the sun shall be darkened and the moon be turned into blood and the stars fall from heaven. I realize this is not a pleasant picture. I take no delight in its portrayal, nor do I look forward to the day when calamity shall come upon mankind. But these words are not my own. The Lord has spoken them, knowing what we know as his servants can we hesitate to raise a warning voice to all who will listen, that they may be prepared for the days ahead? Silence in the face of such calamity is sin, but there is a bright side to an otherwise gloomy picture. The coming of our Lord. Oops. Yeah, that's right. Where was I? Um, the coming of our Lord in all his glory. His coming will be, be both glorious and terrible depending on the spiritual condition of those who remain. Okay, so that's so that's really kind of the preface in the talk. And then President Benson goes on, and, he's, and then he basically lists out three appearances of the Savior. And he says, in his first appearance will be to the righteous saints who have gathered to the New Jerusalem. In this place of refuge, they will be safe from the wrath of the Lord, which will be poured out without measure on all nations. That doesn't sound very fun to me. Modern revelation provides this description. And the glory of the Lord shall be there, and the terror of the Lord shall be there, so it shall also shall be there, in, in so much that the wicked will not come into it, and it should be called Zion. And it shall be cut, 
And it shall come to pass among the wicked that every man that will not take his sword against his neighbor must needs flee unto Zion for safety. And there shall be gathered unto uh, to, there shall be gathered unto it out of every nation under heaven, and it shall be the only people that shall not be at war one with another. So again, you know, this is this is all from DNC forty five, one of the one of the key chapters or the you know, key chapters of the DNC that talks about the second coming. So I've created a little infographic here. And so we're gonna we're gonna first appearance, we're gonna just put a little dot on the infographic. There it is. New Jerusalem, that's his first appearance according to President Benson. And then we're gonna jump to the second appearance will be to the Jews, to these beleaguered sons of Judah surrounded by the gen hostile gentle armies who Again, threatened to overrun Jerusalem, the Savior, their Messiah, will appear and set his feet on the Mount of Olives, and it shall cleave in twain, and the earth shall rent, tremble and reel to and fro, and the heavens also shall shake. The Lord himself will then route the Gentile route, route the Gentile armies, decimating their forces. Judah will be spared no longer to be the to be the persecuted and scattered. The Jews will then approach their deliverer and ask. What are these wounds in thine hands and in thy feet? And I will say unto them, these wounds are the wounds with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I am he who was lifted up. I am Jesus that was crucified. I am the son of God. And then shall they weep because of their iniquities. They shall, then shall they lament because they persecuted their king. Of course, we get that account in DNC 45. And you can also look in Zacharias. Um, I think it's the last couple of chapters, 12 through 14. What a touching drama this will be. Jesus, prophet, Messiah, king, will be welcomed in his own country. Jerusalem will become an eternal city of peace. The sons of Judah will then realize this promise. The tribe of Judah, after their pain, shall be sanctified in holiness before the Lord to dwell in his presence day and night forever and ever. So that's a pretty amazing collection of uh, scriptures from President Benson. So we'll just put another we'll put another little dot on the infographic here and and call it the Mount of Olives. So we've got New Jerusalem and the Americas, and then we've got Mount of Olives uh, over in Old Jerusalem. And President Benson continues: the third appearance of Christ will be to the rest of the world. Here is his description of his coming, and the Lord shall be red in his apparel, and his garments like him that treadeth in the wine vat. We get an account of this one of these in. in uh, a couple of these in Revelations. And so great shall be the glory of his presence that the sun shall hide his face in shame and the moon shall withhold its light and the stars shall be hurled from their places. All nations, all nations will see him in the clouds of heaven clothed with power and with great glory with all the holy angels. And the Lord shall utter his voice and, the, and all the ends of the earth shall hear it. And the nations of the earth shall mourn for they that have laughed shall see their folly. And calamity shall cover the mocker, and the scorner shall be consumed, and they that have watched for iniquity, I've got something over the corner of that, uh, <clears throat> and they that have watched for iniquity shall be hewn down and cast into the fire. So this is this is a, a coming of the an appearance of the Lord that it, to the whole world. It's a great and dreadful day, referred to uh, that. So all of these are it's a cleansing process. To remove the wicked, and and actually, what's happening is the Lord is trying to get people to repent. He's he's preaching his own sermons. He's trying to get people to repent, to come unto him, to look, listen to him, to uh, to bring bring people into compliance with his commandments and with his laws. And there are those who are just going to be ever more recalcitrant. They're not going to do it, and those people will ultimately have to be swept off the earth. Um, and that is the purification and the uh, cleansing process that has to happen before the millennium can fully happen. I think uh, 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 Richard Draper gives a very great uh, talk about that whole, that whole concept and, and why, why that has to happen, or you, otherwise you wouldn't be able to have that millennial peace. Okay, so this is President Nelson or President uh, Benson again. He just he he does a summary. Yes, come he will. He will come in a day of wickedness, a time when men and women will be eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. He will come at a time of great upheaval and tribulation, when the whole earth shall be in commotion. He will come at a time when the Jewish nation is faced with extermination. He will come as a thief in the night, 
when the world least expects him to come. But of that day and hour, no one knoweth. No, not the angels of God in heaven, but my Father only. So that is the conclusion of that portion. That's the entire portion of uh, that talk from President uh, Benson. And that, now we're going to jump over to Bruce R. McConkie, a new witness for the Articles of Faith. And he said, now I want you guys to, we'll, we'll, we'll just tie, as we read this, we're going to talk about this. He cometh to Adam on Diamond. Before the Son of Man comes to reign personally upon the earth. Okay, so that's the millennial reign. Before he descends in flaming fire with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon the ungodly. So now we're talking about a different a group of appearances. That's the appearance to the whole world. That's the great and dreadful day. Before he comes in the clouds of heaven in all the glory of his Father's kingdom. Again, we get the great and dreadful day before he sets his feet once again on the Mount of Olives. So now we have the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, before he stands with 144,000 high priests on Mount Zion in Missouri. So now we have the appearance to the new Jerusalem in Missouri before he suddenly comes to his temple, and that's uh, uh, Malachi, and uh, that is in New Jerusalem as well. Before he utters his voice from the land of Zion and from old Jerusalem, so that's the reference to the reference to the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So now it's referencing the millennium, the state in the millennium, but he's referencing uh, the, the, the appearance in New Jerusalem and Old Jerusalem. So see how confusing this can be? Because right here in this one mm. little sentence, he's talking about all these different things, and they're all mixed in together. And if you don't understand what's going on, it's really, it's really confusing. Uh, before he suddenly comes to his temple, before he utters his voice from the land of Zion um, and, and from old Jerusalem, before all flesh shall see him together. Okay, again, now, now he jumps right back to the great and dreadful day. Before all the appearances that, so all of these appearances that taken together comprise the second coming. So the second coming is all these appearances. So it's this whole process. Before all these he will come in private to Adam on Diamond. Why and for what reason? To receive back from his servants of all ages the keys they have used to govern his earthly kingdom. Then and only then will he deign to reign personally. So, so we can add another, uh, another uh, step on the infographic. And I, I just stuck with the numbering from President Benson, and so I labeled this uh, visitation zero. And the thing that it's interesting to point out I didn't, I didn't pick up on this. I'm not sure who it was where I heard this from, but it made a ton of sense when I heard it, is that each of these appearances are more and more public. So it starts out to just uh, among a, a select group of people, which, which will be all those who have held keys from all ages. So that's a pretty large group of people. So that sounds like a, a, a whole series of conferences and personal priesthood interviews, the rolling up all of the keys. That sounds like quite, quite a solemn assembly. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, all of these, it's starting there, and then ultimately we progress through until we get to the millennial era. So it's important to understand this before we go to the next um, section. Oh, and then we got one more, sorry, one more reference. So this is the infographic in the 2021 Leahona. And so it's he is risen who saw and will see the resurrected Christ. And we have AD 33, we have the present day, and then we have, there's a section called future. And what I've done is I, I basically took that graphic and I changed it, I blew it up so you could see it easier. And, <clears throat> and under the future section, and this is future to April of 2021, we get those at Adam on Diamon. This is just like the infographic we just, we just came from those in the New Jerusalem, the Jews in Jerusalem, and the whole world. So there in four, you know, just a few minutes, probably 10 minutes or so, maybe 15 minutes, I don't know how long we took, there is a little bit of a walkthrough and a map of, of the, uh, a little yeah, bit you. about the nature of the second coming. Thank you, because I think that is confusing to a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. A any any thoughts or? <clears throat> yeah, just it's just good to see how that all all plays, and I like your point of uh, 
each of them being uh, kind of more grand in scope as far as how many people he's appearing to. So, yeah. And so, and again, that's, you know, it's, it's quoting two prophets and revelators. Well, it's, it's, it's the prophet of our dispensation who is uh, receiving revelation from our savior, direct word from our savior through the prophet of our dispensation, plus two prophets and revelators, one who happened to be the president of the quorum of the 12 apostles. And then we get an infographic. Um, it's a good little yeah. summary of that. Okay, so the Great American Eclipse. I'll go through this. I, I could go through this fairly quickly. Um, I think this so is this really one, important because uh, to understand why 2024, the year we're in right now, is so significant, uh, I think we need to know why this eclipse is so significant. Yeah, yeah. So why 2020, which was right in the middle, was so significant. So I'll shut up and let you go. Oh, no, no, you, you know, it's really interesting. So this is the first of, and I didn't, I didn't actually create a, a graphic of all four eclipses, but this is the first of a group of four eclipses, each one of them, uh, each one of them. And then in total, they all have like some very specific things that each one of them meant, but we're just going to talk about this first one. Um, <clears throat> so this was a, so this is going back to, you know, July of 2017, um, I knew that I, it was the Great American Eclipse, and every you know people were talking about it, and it was pretty cool. Hey, this is uh, um, you know this is kind of a once in a lifetime event, and uh, and I will say that if you haven't seen a total eclipse, if you haven't actually been in the path of totality for a total solar eclipse, you owe it to yourself to go do it because it is an amazing event. So. So in, in July of um, 2017, I, I wanted to go to it. So I called up my brother, called up my buddy Sky, and I said, hey, I'm going to go. I'm going to go find a spot in the middle of totality, and uh, I'm going to watch this eclipse. And at this point in time, there was nothing spiritual about it. There was no, it was like an astronomical event that was uh, a fairly rare astronomical event, rare because it was close enough that I could travel and get to it, and I just wanted to go see it. So it was it was just something fun to do, something interesting to do. So we drove around for a couple of days and we picked out, well, and we picked out this spot here, this star, and it was uh, a place called Jenkins Straw and there was a bridge there. So I call, I ended up kind of like tongue in cheek calling it Jenkins Straw Bridge. And that's how we kind of referred to it like during our trip as the draw bridge. <clears throat> but anyway, that, oh, I'm sorry, that's the Google map. Here's the bridge. This is the Wind River up in Wyoming. And uh, West Dinwiddie Lake Road, and we're just off the side of the highway, I think maybe a half a mile or something. So there's my buddy Sky. He's out setting up a 360 camera to get some pictures of the eclipse. We didn't know what we were doing from a photography from a photography standpoint. We didn't have enough, we didn't have the right kind of lenses, but we we're just up there having fun. So this is my brother and my partner in crime. We did a lot of rock climbing and ice climbing and just a bunch of stuff over the years. And so we're just doing what we've done as brothers for a lot of years, going to do cool stuff. So you can look and you can see there's Skyler's camera. There's my camera set up and that's uh, set up to do a time lapse. And then there's my brother. He's got his camera and we're going to try to take some pictures of the eclipse. And so there's yours truly um, with my highly stylish, uh, go ahead and look at the sun eclipse glasses. And uh, the, what I've been able to bring home from this trip, this is the best picture I got. Like I say, I didn't know what I was doing, but this is the best picture of the sun's corona. And this is right at the midpoint of the eclipse. And I, so to me, this is a cherished picture because it, it represents, uh, just a, just, just kind of a fun trip with, with a brother and a good friends and just having a good time and, and seeing something that was actually really spec spectacular to watch. And then the other thing I took some, I think this is a sequence of about 10 photos that I took over. I'm not sure how long it was, maybe 30 seconds or something. And then I just turned that into a, to a little bit of a animation there. And that's commonly called the diamond ring. And you can see why it's called the diamond ring. Um, okay. So now we're going to go and we're going to talk about, we're going to switch shift gears from this fun eclipse trip to this is post 2020. And, um, really kind of the the significance of this eclipse 
So uh, during the eclipse, right, this all the way along this path here, all the way along, there were just places all the way in this path where people had like set out to just just basically do an eclipse party. I'm going to go watch the eclipse. And there's all these locations all along the way. Well, there was a guy in South Carolina, Salem, South Carolina, and there was a DJ there, and he was basically DJing a show. And, um, you know, they had the radio up at the eclipse party, and everybody's getting ready to watch the eclipse and a lot of fun going on. And the DJ says, the eclipse has just made landfall, and now the eclipse is over Salem, Oregon. Well, this, this gentleman in Salem, South Carolina thought to himself, he said, huh, I'm in Salem, South Carolina, and that's over Salem, Oregon. I wonder if there's any other Salems that this eclipse covers. So he looked and he found uh, Salem, Idaho, Salem, Nebraska, Salem, Missouri, and Salem, Kentucky. And then he had to look a little bit harder and he but quite a bit harder, and they found Salem, Wyoming, which actually was a city, a small city, but it's basically defunct, and it's not even on Google Maps. So these are the seven, <clears throat> these are the seven Salems, and this became kind of a famous thing, the seven Salems, and there was all sorts of speculation about what it possibly could have meant, seven Salems, and, um, and so there was a lot of speculation. Um, <clears throat> And a lot of people put out a bunch of different videos on it. And I think I probably watched all of them. And and there were a number of videos that were basically, come on, guys, this, you guys are just being silly. This is nothing. Uh, this is nothing. It's like eclipses happen all the time. And this is just something. And, you know, it's just a random a random occurrence. And, in fact, one, uh, one YouTuber was, basically said, you know, you're more likely – to, you know, it'd be harder to actually not hit seven Salem's than it would be to hit seven Salem's with an eclipse. And that's one of those statements that when you put a, put all the different Salem, you, you put up pins out for everywhere there's a town named Salem, because it's a fairly common name. It seems like it's true, but on closer examination, it's really not true at all. Um, so i shift gears real quick. So NASA has a 5,000 year, they have these maps and each map covers 20 years. So this one is 2020, uh, 2000 to 2020. There are 250 of these maps and they cover a 5,000 year period from 2000 BC to 3000 AD. And, uh, and they all look kind of like this. And you look at it and you go like, wow, there are a lot of eclipses. And it's true. The red ones are annular eclipses and the blue ones are total eclipses. And it turns out that eclipses, total eclipses, are fairly common. About once every 18 months, 18 to 19 months, you'll get a total eclipse. And once every about 17 to 18 months, you'll get an annual, annular eclipse. And that's the ring of fire eclipse, like the one we just had in 2023. I think it was October. Is it October? Yes. Uh -huh. um, that's a significant eclipse as well, but we, we aren't going to really talk about that one today. Um, so I just thought, I just thought, well, you know, Let's forget the seven Salem's. I just want to find out because this whole thing was built as the Great American Eclipse. And one of the unique things about it was this is the first, somebody had said this is the first eclipse that crosses only on land in the lower 48 states since, you know, using current political boundaries since the pilgrims landed here. And so I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. That's that's pretty rare. So I wanted to find out when, how far back do I have to go to find the, an eclipse that did that? And it turns out I had to go back almost 800 years. And here it is right here. It's this, uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow, 1257, June 13th. And it goes right through here. And so you had just to, just to hit the lower 48 and touch nothing else, you'd have to go back about 800 years to find that. So, um, <clears throat> It turns out, I've, I found out that if you stand on one spot on the earth and you kind of need to move away from the poles a little bit, maybe 10 degrees or so on, on each way. If you stand on one spot, you're going to probably be waiting about 400 years for a total eclipse to pass over you. I think it's a little bit less than 400, 390 or 380 something. I can't remember exactly right. But so for a specific location, eclipses just aren't that, that common. So anyway, I'll, uh, one other thing that's really interesting. Notice 
Notice the difference in the width of totality. So the blue ones, again, the blue ones are, are total eclipses, and then the red ones are annular eclipses. So the so notice how wide this one is compared to them. I'll just go back real quick. Whoops. Oops. Okay, so compared to this one, this is our 2017 eclipse. Now look how wide this one, this other one is. Quite a bit wider, like maybe twice as wide. Well, it turns out total eclipses can be anywhere from about zero to 200 miles wide, and they can vary quite a bit. And that's due to the 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 moon is in a in a uh, elliptical orbit around the Earth, and so sometimes it's closer to the Earth, and sometimes it's further away from the Earth, and so. When it comes between the Earth and the Sun, it just depends on how close or how far away it is, whether you're going to get an annular or a total eclipse and whether and what the width of totality is going to be. So the width of totality varies quite a bit. Okay, so let's go back to our August 21st, 2017 eclipse. And so in the midst of all these people, all this discussion, it meant something, it didn't mean something, all sorts of speculations about what it possibly could have meant. I, I kind of just started thinking like, well, wait a second. There's one Salem that nobody's talking about, and this is the important Salem. This is the New Jerusalem. <clears throat> and I said, I wonder if the eclipse hit the New Jerusalem. Okay, so at 9 minutes and 15 seconds after 1 p.m. Central Daylight Time, Here's where this, this is where the spot of totality was, right there. Okay, and that's it right there. And we're going to zoom in on that. And so there it is. There, there it's zoomed up. <clears throat> and there's uh, Kansas City right here at the bottom. And, of course, there's Independence right there. So there's Kansas City. Go Chiefs. All you Chiefs fans out there. Oh, Mahomes and Otto. Okay, and let's see. Okay, so... Here's in, here's just a just a a, a, a zoom of uh, a zoom of the area around Independence and the Temple lot turns out is somewhere right around I'm guessing about right here. So I go wow well it caught the Temple lot and it looks like it caught Independence so that's that's pretty interesting. Um, so it did it did catch the important Jerusalem uh, Salem, uh, the New Jerusalem. Okay, so that as as I found that, then I I kind of thought like, well, you know, there's another spot out here that's kind of kind of important too, and that's Adam on Diamon. I wonder if this eclipse caught Adam on Diamon, and so there is, uh, there is, you know, a blow up of Adam on Diamon. Here's the river. So Adam on Diamon is in this area right here, and here is Spring Hill right here. So I thought, well, if I'm going to put a stake in the ground as to the the two points where I would say are the places that would have to catch would be, and I and I've got dots on them. That's Spring Hill. So there's Spring Hill, and there is that's the Temple Lot. And so I thought, well, that caught both of those places. Well, that is pretty interesting, and that's pretty amazing. Um, but as I thought about that, when I looked at this Temple Lot to the edge of the eclipse, it's about somewhere around four miles from the edge. Now, the Spring Hill is like right at the edge. And I kind of thought like, okay, so you are the chief, you are the great astrophysicist, the great engineer of galaxies and solar systems. And you're gonna do a sign and you're gonna miss it by four miles. I'm going like, okay, I'm not, I'm not getting, and I, I rechecked everything, and I went through this a couple of times because I thought, like, why in the world would that be off by four miles? I mean, why wouldn't it be exact? If you're going to go to the trouble to make this be a sign, why wouldn't it be exact? And so I didn't have an answer, and I went without an answer to that for about a year, and then I was reading through the uh, Doctrine and Covenants, and, <clears throat> excuse me, this jumped out at me, um, this time through, it jumped out at me. Hearken, O ye elders of my church, said the Lord your God. Oh, and just a, a little bit of a background on this. Uh, DNC 52 through 56 is all about, they just finished a conference, and there were 30 elders who got called to go two by two to the western part of the state of Missouri, to Independence, to Jackson County, Missouri, and the Lord was going to reveal the place for the city of Zion. Uh, and and you can go read about that in DNC 52 through 56. Um, 
And so I'll keep reading. Who uh, uh, saith the Lord your God, who have assembled yourselves together according to my commandments in the land, in this land, which is the land of Missouri, which is the land which I have appointed and consecrated for the gathering of the saints. Uh, wherefore, this is the land of promise and the place for the city of Zion. And thus saith your Lord, the Lord your God, if ye will receive wisdom, here is wisdom. Behold, the place which is now called independence is the center place. And the spot for the temple is lying westward upon a lot, which is not far from the courthouse. And when I read that, when I read that uh, this specific time, the place which is now called independence jumped out of the page at me just like it was pink, just like right here in this slide. It was just like it was pink. It jumped out and I go, that's it. So I raced, I went to my computer, I pulled up my maps, and I couldn't find any of the old political boundaries for the city of Independence, so I just used the current uh, political boundaries for the city of Independence. And I thought, well, you know, it said the place which is now called Independence, so I kind of just thought to myself, well, that's probably, that's what I got, so I'm going to trace them out. So I traced those, I traced those out really quickly on the map, and I was dumbfounded because here is the edge of the totality, and there is the outline of the city of independence, the place, which is now called independence. And I went, that's the answer. Oh, my heavens, that is the answer. <clears throat> um, so so just... how, how exact, exact God is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it just, you know... Um, so I'm going to jump jump back. And so still, as I was going through this process, it was uh, I, from from certain people, and, I, and I'm not throwing rocks at anybody. I'm really not. I think just people have, they have different perspectives and places they're coming from. But as I would try to talk, I, I'm, well, you could tell I'm pretty excited about this. And as I would try to talk to people, um, a lot of them just would, their eyes would glaze over and they would just wander away, you know, mid-sentence. <laughs> they just... You know, and then some people, you know, you would get, you'd almost get like one of these, you know, get the hints, you know, why are you talking about this stuff? So I just thought I'd throw this scripture in there. And this is uh, BNC 45, 39 through 40. And it shall come to pass that he that feareth me shall be looking forth for the great day of the Lord to come. We should be looking for the day of the Lord to come. We should be anticipating it. We should be preparing for it even for the signs of the coming of the Son of Man. We should be looking for the signs. We got a warning from Joseph Smith. He taught, you know, we, we just previously here. Um, in, it's important to understand the times that you're in. And they shall see signs and wonders. And who is they? The antecedent here is he that feareth me. And they shall see signs and wonders. A lot of people, when they look at this eclipse, they don't see anything. But if you're really looking at it, all of a sudden you have eyes to see and understand what you're looking at. And they shall see signs and wonders, for they shall be shown forth in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. So I, I just uh, made a graphic here that's a little bit more emphasized. Um, so the, the, the bright red ring is the, the eclipse totality. So there's Adam on Diamond right there, right at the edge. I mean, it's, it is right at the edge. And here is independence. And look at that. I mean, it fits like a glove. Um, so after I, after I uh, found that scripture in the DNC 57 and went and made these graphics, then I felt like, well, I've got to go check all of those 5,000 years of eclipses because <clears throat> they're fairly easy to check. But it did take me, you know, it took me the better part of, you know, two and a half days to go through every one of those and anything that looked close, I had to go look at it, you know, in detail. So it was a bit of work because there was 11,898 eclipses. I think that's the right number that I had to go through. <clears throat> and I can tell you in 5,000 years, there is not one other eclipse, unless I miss something, but there's not one other eclipse that even comes close to doing what this eclipse did right here, right here. So that's in 5,000 years. This is a unique event, and it is precise. Um, That's some amazing work. Yeah, and so if, you know, if, and all you would have to do to refute that that claim is just, uh, you just need a date. Give me a date, and we can go look at it. And and so, you know, 
I I wouldn't bear I'm not going to bear my testimony that I know this eclipse is true and I'm not going to do the traditional testimony the test it's there I mean the data is out there you can go searching you can find this stuff on Google you can you can put this all together for yourselves um <clears throat> the 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 testimony of this is it is etched into the internet it's etched into the record um I just I just feel like uh um happy to be somebody who found it now Maybe somebody else has found this. I haven't seen anybody who's found this at this point, but um, okay. So this was okay. So I'm gonna, whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So as I was doing this, and as I was finishing this up and looking at these clips, what what kept jumping out at me is this little city right here, Saint Joseph, and I just kept ignoring it. But it's this little city, and it's right in the path of totality, and it just like. It just kept kind of popping up, like St. Joseph, St. Joseph. And it's like, and I go, yeah, 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 it's not what I'm interested in. And it's like, I'm, I'm looking at these. Um, but it finally did, and I kind of, okay, St. Joseph. It's like, I just, I just said, well, I'm going to put, I'm going to do the political boundaries around the city of St. Joseph. And so there is St. Joseph in the middle of the eclipse. Now, this is the eclipse of totality. It was about a minute, I think about a minute and 20 seconds before that previous uh, took so so these things the eclipse they move through and they, they the path of the spot of totality excuse me it moves through you know anywhere from maybe depending on where it is and located on the earth and just all the geometries that come into play between like maybe a thousand and five thousand miles an hour so they come it comes flying through um but there's saint joseph right in the middle and this was about a minute and 20 seconds before that other spot of totality and I and this is I I kind of have to say duh to myself because now I'm going like okay well who was Saint Joseph, you know and as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, um, in in Salt Lake City there's a there's a hospital it's called Saint Mark's Hospital and if you're going to go there you're going I'm going to Saint Mark's, um, but if you go to look up a scripture and you go oh I want to look at Luke 21, we don't say just as part of our you know, the, the vernacular we use, we don't say St. Luke chapter 21. We just say Luke 21, or we say Matthew 21, or Matthew 24, or we might say John 1. And we don't, we don't typically say saint. <clears throat> and so, you know, the traditional Christianity, fourth century Christianity, um, you know, we, we are the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We, well, we're all, we're all saints. But traditional fourth century Christianity basically gives honorific titles to people as, as being saints. They get sainted just like, uh, you know, knights get knighted or something like that, I think. And so I had to look it up. Who was St. Joseph? Because there's lots of Josephs. There's lots of Josephs. And so um, and I looked it up and, and it's like, duh. It's like, it was Joseph, husband of Mary the earthly father of Jesus. So St. Joseph was, was the earthly father of Jesus. So I, so I kind of had to say dust. So here we are. We've got this eclipse. A minute and 20 seconds before we get this path of totality, the eclipse is spotlighting the city bearing the name of his father on earth just before it spotlights the first two places where Christ appears on earth during his second advent, his second coming. And it is exactly the right width. It's very close to the right width. I mean, almost almost exactly the right width. It's the Goldilocks width of totality. And it is also the Goldilocks path of totality. If it was any further north, it would miss part. Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't capture independence the way it does. If it was any further south, it would miss Adam on Diamond. So this thing just, it nails these two points just very precisely. So I, uh, I I get to this point and I said I am I am convinced this is a sign in the heavens and this eclipse is significant <clears throat> and so there we go and that's what I was prepared to talk about. Um, that is amazing, Rob. That's uh, it. Just uh, reminds me of how exact God is and that He's written the story of 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 the earth in the, in the stars and um, that there are appointed times for 
so many things. So there are a lot of eclipses and and for it to be a sign, there has to be, you know, I, I came to this conclusion, it has to be unique and it has to be significant. And there's really only three things that like make an eclipse significant. And one is location of totality on the earth. And that includes the width of totality and the path of totality. This eclipse, it, it nailed that. The other one is the location in the heavens. Where is the sun in the ecliptic when the moon passes in front of it? So there's the location in the heavens. And I've done some work that's... Uh, uh, probably about the same level as the location in the heavens, it, it passes off in similar fashion. And then there's location and time, which is, of course, 2017. And what happened in 2017 and what, what uh, you know, there are a number of historical events that just like stack up just beautifully to 2017. Um, each one of those would be an hour, hour and a half probably to get through each one of those. But I can put a check in the box right now. I think we can put a check in the box that the location of totality on the earth is definitely unique and it's definitely very significant. And so that's, that's what I, that's what I got. That, that is awesome. And I, I'm so grateful that you uh, shared that with our listeners, <clears throat> but uh, you know, for me, all of this, uh, all of this information for me is just more evidence. And, uh, you know, it's evidence that listeners can to take to the Lord for themselves. And, uh, but it, it points to 2024 because the, the follow-up eclipse crosses over in, in 2024, I believe April 8th. Yep. And uh, um, we don't have time to go into some other things I could, but, uh, you know, the, the, the timelines that we, that we see with, uh, you know, some of these different uh, comings of the Lord that you talked about. Um, it, it's very significant that uh, 2024 is a kind of a starting point for seven years of uh, tribulation in America, um, which overlaps the seven years of tribulation in in Israel, in, in Jerusalem. And we won't take time for all that, but... Thank you again so much for coming on. And uh, I think this helps yeah. us see some very, very significant things are happening in our time. And uh, it's, an, uh, it's a very interesting and amazing time we're living in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for, thank you for having me, Randy. And I, I think that, you know, the, so I see all this stuff and I, and, and it kind of fascinates me. I'm an engineer, I'm a techno geek and I, I kind of enjoy, I enjoy the, the astronomy part of it, but, you get all that done and, and then you have to ask the question, okay, so now what? So I have, and, and I think you're exactly right. It's a piece of evidence. Of the, it's just one more piece of evidence and we've got tons of, tons of, and there's just a number of statements from President Nelson um, that are mm -hmm. just, they're just mind boggling. And, uh, um, but, but so, okay, so, so we have all this stuff, but what? And, and I think the thing is to, to really, um, to, to awaken and start really paying attention to what's going on. It's, I don't know exactly, I don't know exactly how to say it, but the way I see the world now um, is very different than the way I saw it pre 2020. I mean, it's very different. And, and as a, a, you mentioned, you were at the Bountiful Temple and, and as a result, almost, it was almost just by accident, I ended up getting a, a calling to work at the Draper Temple, and I just I love it, and it is absolutely fantastic. I have a testimony that I will bear testimony of this that time spent in the temple is absolutely important and it's very valuable. And um, there is stuff you can get there that you can't get anywhere else. President Nelson called the temple a place of security, unlike any other, and I and I will add my testimony to his testimony that the 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 temples are the 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 exponential growth of temples the explosion of temples that we've had in the last three or four years almost doubling in number um is to bless those who are willing to go there and worship and those who are willing to go there and serve it all comes down to um becoming more spiritually in tune and, and prepared because 
that we are in a different time period, that we did pass the hinge point in 2020, and I am convinced we are in a different time period. Things are not the same as they were for my parents um, and even my, you know, some of my older brothers and, and sisters. And it's not the same. It's a different, it's a different world. Mm -hmm. The times are different. Things are accelerating. And um, we need, well, President Nelson say, what did we take? We need to take extraordinary measures because unprecedented times require unprecedented measures. Um, yep. If, if we're doing the same thing we were doing five or 10 years ago, um, I think we're not listening to the prophet. The prophet has told us we need to, we, you know, uh, who was it who said lengthen our stride? President, was that President Kimball? Probably, yeah. Yeah, but uh, but <clears throat> I think we're in a whole nother, we're in a whole nother ball game. And um, so that's that's what that's what I would say. It's just, yeah. um, it, it is so important that we we pay attention to um, to our covenants, to, you know, sanctifying our homes, uh, following our priesthood leaders, and sustaining them, and uh, spending time in the temple, learn, learning what our covenants really mean. Thank you for being with us on the Spiritual Survival Podcast. Again, if the mission of our podcast resonates with you, please click subscribe, like, and share this content.